Hi, and welcome to Group B's 218150 Introduction to Measuring Systems assignment. These are the group members involved with photos of the site safe passport as well as Massey student ID being displayed in the written report. So the key purpose of this report is to display Group B's understanding towards the basics of the schedules of quantities and allow our students to become practically familiar with the measuring aspects within the construction industry in accordance to New Zealand standard 4202 measurement of rules of measurement. So this report allows the members of Group B to see, touch and feel the typical items of measurement that are mostly gathered by the construction contractors. The aspects we will be exploring are the concrete works and carpentry, carpentry being split up into two sections, treatments and the external framing units. So here's um, the content we'll be covering. So for concrete works, A, um, we'll be covering concrete laid on the hard floor under slab and footings, um, damp proof membrane, construction joints, weather bar and power float finish. Uh, carpentry B1, so the first section is species, grades, treatments and applications and carpentry B2, the external wall framing units, the measurements and the typical sizes. Hi, my name is Patrick King and I did a part of the Concrete Works group. In the Concrete Works we looked at five parts. We looked at A1, site concrete, A2, damp proof membrane to ground floor, A3, concrete joint and ground slab, A4, weather bar and ground slab, and A5, power float finish to ground slab. Hello everyone, my name is Ni Su and I'm doing A1 and A2 part. Firstly, A1 is about site concrete. Side concrete is a kind of blinding material which is laid above the hard film to provide a smooth surface and prevent the DPM. The typical strength of side concrete is 10 ampere and typical thickness is 50 millimeters. According to Standard New Zealand 4202, blinding concrete should be measured in square meters with the thickness stated. Secondly, part A2 is DPM. The purpose of DPM is to prevent the moisture damage from the ground to the concrete slab. The most commonly used material is polyethylene with typical thickness of 0.25 mm. The gauge of DPM refers to the ability to prevent water, and it must be not less than 90 meganewton seconds per gram. According to Standard New Zealand 4202, the damp proof sheeting should be measured in square meters. Hi, I'm Neil. I'm doing the A3 and A4, which is a construction joint and the metal bar. So for the part of the construction joint, uh, the, for the, uh, the most important thing we should know is the why the concrete go cracking. As we know, when the pouring concrete has completed, the, con the construction uh, needs at least uh, 20, 28 days to dry. In this process, th there has a problem, which is the con concrete cracking. Based on the internet results, it is caused if the concrete is weak in tension or the temperature or monitor change at the process of driving. Uh, next, when we went to the construction site, we could see the construction joint in the, con in the, in the ground slab. We asked the manager about it. He said if the con concrete slab is too big, it will appear cracking very easily. The construction joint can be prevent cracking effectively. Uh, for the concrete, for the con construction joint, there are four types, which are creating, forming, toming, and swelling and uh, pacing joint formers. For the most resi residential buildings, they use the swellings. Uh, for measuring, based on the New Zealand standards, the joint will be measured in meters if not over 300 micrometers wide, or in square meter if over 300. Uh, for the weather bar, as a part of the weather bar in ground slab, there are many different types of the weather bar, such as the dwelling bar and, um, and water bar. For the most common type is door bar. From the internet resource, a door bar are short steel rods placed at the joints of the concrete pavement to provide a connection between the slabs. Next, 
for the advantage of the using uh, using doorbar, it can increase the service life by improving the load transfer and it can also pr prevent the falling at joints. In order to piece the doorbar, the doorbar should normally be located at mid middle deep of the slab. For horizontal spacing, uh, doorbar are typically paced uh, 12 inch apart. Start with the first bar 12 inches from the edge of the slab. Part A5 of the concrete works is the power float finish. When finishing concrete, there are many methods that can be used, and power floating is one of the kind. It is known as a U2 class finish. This is generally used for flooring such as um, carpet to put over. It is carried out by a power trail that buffs the concrete, and is less prone to cracks because of this. My name is Yu Ping Guo. ID number is 15212551. I'm talking about the timber treatments. Timber treatment prevents against insects and fungal tract and preserves the quality of the timber. There are three types of timber treatments. The first one is boron compounds. The second one is CCA compounds. And the last one is LOSP. It's important to note that the chemicals used are harmful to humans' eyes, skin, and the respiratory system. In the process of the operation, precautions must be taken during working, including wear gloves, masks, and protective clothing. This table shows the identification of timber treatments. It's discussed in terms of hazard class, color, types of treatments, preservative number, and typical uses. For example, the color of H1.2 is pink or red. The types of timber treatments is boron. 11 is the preservative number. It's mainly used for the wall framing. There is a clear explanation about H3.1 and H3.2. This figure shows the typical example of piece branding. Please look at this number. It's made up of three sections, including plant number, preservative number, and hazard class. It will be a tag to attach to the timber to show the specific information. Hello, my name is Marshall Wells and I am part of Group B for Assignment 2 for Paper 218150. Treatments, H1.1. H1.1 treated timber is one of the lowest treated timbers. This means that it is far less resistant to things such as moisture and fungi as opposed to higher rated or higher treated timber. H1.1 timber is rated to be used in an environment that is sheltered from the weather at all times and is also above ground. Uh, H1.1 treated timber comes with the biological hazard of borer, which is small insects which can eat through timber. Uh, the typical uses for H1.1 treated timber are normally for interior finishing timber, and you can determine whether it is H1 or H1.1 or not because it will usually be used as end bracing. H4 treated timber. H4 treated timber is far more resistant than H1.1. Uh, it is rated to be permanently exposed to the weather and can be in contact with the ground or with fresh water. However, it does have its biological hazards as well, such as DK fungi or borer. Uh, the typical uses for H4 timber uh, fence posts, landscaping timbers not requiring a building consent. And you can determine this because it won't have any added colour to it, like other ones. The natural colour of treated timber is varying shades of green or brown. H5 treated timber. H5 is the highest treatment level. Uh, it can also be exposed to the weather at all times and can be in contact with the ground or fresh water. Uh, it carries the same biological hazards as H4 treated timber. Uh, the typical uses are for things such as house piles and poles which are in contact with the ground 
or crib walling or posts in the ground for decks and verandas. You can also determine it because it looks the same as H4 with no added colour. The natural colour of green or brown will show. Uh, here is an example of H1.2 treated timber. You can see the pink colour it is being given from the treatment and you can see on the label here H1.2. This is an example of H3.2 treated timber. Uh, you can see stamped on the end of the timber H3.2. Here is an example of H4. You can see that it is still the natural colour of the timber and on the tag just here it says H4, H4 treated timber. And finally, here is some H5 treated timber. Again, you can see the natural color is still there, and you can see H5 just written there on the label. Thank you. Hi, this is Leon. Today I introduction some timber of grids. The timber can be roughly divided into two grids. First is, is the appearance grids. This grid is, this grid of the timber is more focused on the appearance. In the construction works, to play of the role of landscaping. The other grid is a structural grid. This grid timber is more used for the structure of frame of the buildings. More grids of wooden plate are supplied as the either green or clean dried, treated or untreated, rough so or surface. It's according from Lumberlink 2000. 17. This kind of classification does help use to select a prudent type based on difference of location of constructions. Why lumber grid is important? The answer is, is this kind of classification does help use to select a prudent type based on difference of locations of constructions. Hello everyone, my name is Rui Xin. Today I will introduce two ways of identifying the temple grades. But before that, let's take some let's take a look at some pictures. Some pictures. Yep. For this one it's good because both sides of the temple is clear and for this one here just have some dark dots. But it's still good because just a few. Yeah, this one. Yeah, this one. You can see for the dark dots, it's, it's different because you can see this one is big, the other one is small, and the place is different. Yeah, the dark door, the dark dot place, this one is on the side. And this one is quite the middle of the temper. Yeah, the size of the dark dots is different. Are different. Yeah. Yeah, different. Yeah. Uh, for the left, for the picture on the left, is for indoor use, and the right. The, the picture on the right is for outdoor use. Okay, okay, now let's move on to the two ways of identifying the wood grades. You guys can have a look with the uh, PowerPoint, but I will see something a little different for the PowerPoint. The first one, the visual grading. The visual grading is a traditional method of determining a string's grade. The quantity inspector needs to judge the temper grade by observing the temper surface characteristic. The characteristic size and uh, the place will affect, uh, will affect the grade of the temper. The highest grade along a fuller and the smaller characteristic in each of the temper. Just like the just like the first picture we have seen, that temper should be got a really high grade because the both sides is clear, have no dark dot. And then uh, the brief of the racial grading. The racial grading do not need a large machine for the test, so it can be done anytime and anywhere. But 
the quantity inspector needs to know the knowledge and the rule of the temper grade temper grade. Uh, the second is the second way to identify the wood grade is the machine strength grading. The, mas the machine strength grading is passed through the each temper to a machine. The temper grade is uh, identified by the strength and the stiffness of the wood. Uh, this, th uh, this method requires a professional machine. The, re the result the result of the machine string the machine string grading is more accurate than the virtual grading. Okay, that's the things I want to talk to you guys. And uh, before we finish, let's see a picture, the photo. Yeah, in this photo, in this photo is testing a um, maximum of the wood strength and the stiffness. Uh, and I'm doing the species part of carpentry B1. In the New Zealand construction industry, there are a range of species used, such as native species as Rimu and Kodi, all the way along to exotic species such as Theridita pine, as well as other things used in small niche areas of the house, such as Douglas fir. The most common of which is Theridita pine, which takes up 89% of the New Zealand plantation industry. It's generally used for things such as structural framing, external cladding, and particle board. Whereas native timbers such as Rimu and Kauri, mostly Rimu, are used for finishes and other aesthetically pleasing features due to their, their appeal and their difficulty to find. Other things such as Douglas fir are used generally on a person-to-person -person basis due to its lack of ability to use in situations due to its lack of treatment. Now, on to Redita Pine. Bear with. Redita pine is popular due to its abundance because it takes up 89% of the of the plantation industry. Also, it has a 12% moisture content. It's easy to treat and it has an average 500 kg per m3 density. The elasticity is 8.23 GPA and the compression strength of parallel grain is 36.8 MPA. It's also good for machining, which makes it good for furnishings and other things such as that. Its all-round durability and usability, combined with its plentiful supply, makes it a prime use of for the New Zealand construction industry. Bear with. The Rimu, which is one of the most popular New Zealand native woods, is, is strong and has a moderate durability. It's also very appealing. It has a mass... Before the mass plantation of Rita Pine, it was commonly used for framing due to its, its density and its moisture content which is 12%, such as Dredita pine, due to the fact that it is also a heartwood the same as Dredita pine. It has a 15, uh, 516 uh, kg per m3 density, an elasticity of 9.65 GPA, and a compression of parallel strength as 39.2 MPA. While there is still a reasonable amount of removal in hardwood, High quality remove is difficult to find, making it expensive, making it a very niche thing used for furnishings and others. Yeah, with the Douglas fir was first available in New Zealand in the late 18, 1940s. By by the 60s, there was 60,000 M3 was sawn per per annum, and by 1988, it was over 170,000. Today, it's dropped back down to around 155 due to, um, due to its lack of, of usability, supplying 35% of New Zealand production timber and 6% of the plantation. Douglas fir has a lifespan of 10 to 15 years in ground contact and 15 to 25 when it's away from the ground. It cannot be pressure treated with CCA H3.2 hazard glass, and there is nor is there currently any H3.1 treatments approved for Douglas fir. It has a 13% moisture content, elasticity of 10 GPA, and a wide range of densities depending on the altitude, generally around 450 kg M3. The Douglas fir is most commonly used for roof trusses, framing, and internal paneling due to and glue laminated beams. The bottom plate is a framing member, which is the lowest wall framing component and holds the entire external wall framing unit together and connects with the vertical studs. It's very similar to the top plate, but just opposite. Um, the bottom plate is always bolted with M12 bolts or post-fix anchors into the concrete or foundation if it's on the ground floor 
or um, into the floorboards and bearers if it's on um, the above floors. So the typical length of the bottom plate is um, determined by the length or the dimensions of the rooms or yeah, the external faces, but it's always the same length as the bottom plate. Um, the typical width and thickness of the bottom plate is always the same as the top plate studs and dwangs with the sectional sizes um, being one of three, uh, 75 by 50, 100 by 50 or 150 by 50. Here's a photo of the um, bottom plate with the post, um, N12 bolt holding it down into the foundation. The stud is the only vertical component of the external framing unit which connects the bottom and top plate and act as, they act to simply transfer the above load from the top plate to the floor and then foundation, allowing the foundation with the most reinforcements to take the majority of the compression force. The studs also act as a fixing point for the building paper cavity battens and the external and internal linings. The studs also create an internal cavity for the services and insulation. So the typical width and thickness of the studs are the same as the top plate, bottom plate and dwangs like the bottom plates, but the um, typical length of the studs are based on the height of the ceiling with the average ceiling height being 2.4 meters, some going up to three meters. As a result, the length of the stud is the ceiling height, subtract twice the dress thickness of the um, bottom plate and top plate, just to get the difference, just the in-between sections. Uh, the tickle width and thickness of the studs are the same as the top plate, bottom plate and dwangs. The typical length of the studs are based on the height of the ceiling and the average ceiling height being 2.4 meters in New Zealand, some going up to 3 meters. As a result, the length of the stud is the ceiling height, subtract twice the dress thickness of the top or bottom plate, just to get that difference. The spacing of the studs are determined on the thickness of the cladding materials, which will be situated on top. For example, if the timber cladding is thicker than 80 mils, a max stud spacing of 600 millimeters is recommended. Um, if it's 80 millimeters thick or less, the max stud spacing should be 450 meters. This is according to Brand's building guide. So the sectional sizes are the exact same. Um, as the bottom plate, as earlier explained, 75 by 50, 100 by 50, and 150 by 50. There are two types of bracing used within the external framing unit, temporary bracing and permanent bracing. Um, as shown here, temporary bracing is wooden bracing which ensures that all the frames line up and are leveled and 90 degrees in relation to the foundation or flooring. So when the roof trusses, purlins, or bearers and joists are installed, it is done correctly the first time around with no mishaps. The typical size of bracing is highly dependent on the bracing requirements of the walls and the floor size of the room. And lastly, the diagonal length of the different external framing units um, because they usually span diagonally because it gives a greater impact. The sectional sizes differ because they're essentially scrap wood. They come in 75 by 50, 100 by 50, or 150 by 50. Here's a photo of the um, temporary bracing that we saw on the sides. Okay. So, permanent bracing consists of cut and angle bracing, metal angle bracing, which connects diagonally twice between the bottom and top plates or plywood sheet bracing which attacks directly to the outside of the external wall framing. These permanently resist against the horizontal loads from collapsing under the wind and earthquake due to shearing force. According to the Quanti Surveyor Handbook, the plywood sheet bracing system is measured in meters squared and as it is a type of sheet thing, measuring deductions should be made for any openings of one meter squared or more. Also, according to the Quantisphere Handbook, the cut and angle bracing is measured in meters. The typical sizes of the cut and angle bracing, um, they are typically cut to span from the top and bottom of the plate at a 45 degree angle where practical. 
Thus, the length of the brace will be determined by the height of the ceiling and also the length, which is covered. The average ceiling height is 2.4, therefore the typical length of the brace is approximately 3.4 meters. The typical width and thickness of the cutting galvanized um, steel angle bracing is 25 millimeters by 0.6 millimeters. So plyo bracing, the typical width and length of plyo bracing is um, 2,400 millimeters um, by 1,200. So 2.4 by 1.2 or 2.7 by 1.2 which are further cut to size in order to fit tightly into place outside the external framing unit. The thickness is determined by many factors including the stud spacing, width of top and bottom plate, sheathing section and grading, uh, stress grading of that and the required kilonewtons per meter capacity. The common thickness of plywood are is uh, six millimeters or seven millimeters, but can go up to nine millimeters depending on the factors. For example, uh, we have a 17.4 um, kilonewtons per meter capacity eco ply plywood bracing system. The sheath section must be less than 900 millimeters wide, and if the stud spacing is 450 millimeters with 90 millimeters by 45. Uh, five millimeters top and bottom plates, it could have a bracing uh, system of seven millimeters stress grade F8 or ply bracing of six millimeters stress grade 11. So there's many types of different bracings determined by the factors that are covered within the requirements. Um, these are photos of the on site, um, for, of the on site bracing that I saw. On the left here, we see cut and angle bracing forming a nice 45 degree angle and on the right we see plywood bracing of six millimeters um, holding uh, attached to the external frame. DPC which is abbreviated for damper of course is a membrane sheet which is stapled to the underside of the bottom plate between the frame and the foundation or between the batten and the masonry wall and it prevents the absorption of moisture which is contained in the concrete ground or soil. This um, ensures the framing unit insulation and internal wall lining remains dry and moisture free, allowing the structural integrity and aesthetics of the component to be maintained. According to NZS 4202, DPM is measured in meters and also described in meters with the approximate width stated. As the DVC was stapled across the bottom of the bottom plate or on the battens, the typical approximate width of the DPC is dependent on the width of the bottom plate or batten which could either be 100 millimeters, 150 millimeters, or 200 millimeters, depending on the structural demand of the building. The sectional size for the purpose within the external uh, timber framing, it has a thickness of 0.5 millimeters. Building paper is part of the external timber wall cladding system and acts to assist the control of moisture by ensuring that any moisture that penetrates the wall cladding is managed back to the exterior. Um, of the building and doesn't come in contact with the external framing system. According to NZS 4202, um, building paper is measured and described in square meters of surface area covered with the lappings and fixings being stated. Also deductions shall be made for all openings greater and including one meter squared, which relates to the doors and window inlets where the building paper must be folded. The typical overlapping of the building paper which displays good practice is 150 millimeters or 0.015 meters. The typical width of the building paper used and the area of coverage changes with the brand of building paper. Within the site I investigated the brand used was Thermocraft Watergate Plus 295 and the roll had a length of 18.5 meters and a standardized width of 1.37 meters allowing for the total square meter coverage of 24 meters squared. Here we see the use of building paper in my site and how we could see that the overlappings were present and the width of 1.37. So overall in conclusion, the key purpose of this report was to get a hands-on practical learning experience with the typical materials found in the residential construction environment. Through this report, Group B became very familiar with the New Zealand standard 
4202 standard method of measurements of building works and how to apply it within the measurement of the typical construction materials. In addition, we also learned about the basis of the um, schedules or quantities, the purpose of each material component or process, and lastly, where possible, the typical sizes. Um, all the knowledge we obtain throughout this research project will be very valuable when pursuing our future careers uh, within the construction industry. Thank you very much for listening to the report. Our references for the information we are gathered are in the, um, the written report, which is attached. Thank you.